our speaker today is Kamil Dujekwa. So Kamil did his uh, PhD uh, uh, at the Imperial College London, and he was a uh, postdoc uh, at the University of Sydney and then uh, at the University of Gdańsk. And currently, he is the head of the quantum resources group at the Jagiellonian University. This is a project which is financed by the uh, Foundation for Polish Science. This is a team that project in which we also participate. We have our own group here within this project. And today, Kamil will tell us about finite size effects in quantum thermodynamics. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for the invitation and the possibility to <coughs> talk about my research field with such a great audience. Um, so the title maybe sound a little weird, but I wanted to have this one title and kind of oscillate a uh, few research projects that we did in our group in the past. So I was also asked to do a slow build up to the results. So don't, those of you who are familiar, don't get uh, too bored too quickly because there's going to be like 10 slides of rough introduction and then uh, I'll get to some results. Right, um, I'm afraid it doesn't work out. Can we click maybe? I think you have to open the PDF. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, now it's working. Good. <laughs> so, uh, this is the outline that I put before. I give the outline to just introduce uh, a few people that I was working on um, on those projects that we talk about. Patrick um, is now in Switzerland, in Geneva, Marcus in Singapore, Chris, and we met in Sydney, now in Zurich. And, and then there is my PhD student from the University, Alex, and a PhD student of Michal Wardeski and Michal from Gdansk. So the outline is as follows. I will first um, give a few words of motivation. What kind of questions do we want to study and why? I will then present the thermodynamic setting that we work with and say a few words about uh, <coughs> the central problem that we, that we uh, try to solve, which is a state interconversion problem. And, how to relate the problems, why it's important to state the conversion problem. And then there's two sections on the, on the results. Uh, I will first talk about uh, better established results on coherent thermodynamics, where um, we basically deal with states that count the prepared and superpositions of energizing states. This is much more well established, but, uh, so there's going to be more results here. And then I will tell you some. Uh, about some of the recent results, uh, some even unpublished on, on coherent thermodynamics. We'll see how it goes with time. I'm not 100% sure we can cover all of this. I can cover all of this. All right. So I would like to start with the following question What can we say about the dynamics of a given system without solving equations of motion? <coughs> so, can we say something sensible, something uh, meaningful? Without actually solving all the equations of motion and, and getting uh, you know the exact um, the state of the system at a given time. Well, uh, for closed systems, we have things like we have conservation laws. For example, we have energy conservation. If you think of a classical system here, um, uh, let's say a harmonic oscillator in one, one dimension, and I tell you that at a given time it's prepared, its uh, its position is here and its momentum is here, then you don't need to solve all the equations of motions to know that at any other time you're going to look at it, it's going to be constrained, its state is going to be constrained to this resistance. Right? Of course, I'm saying closed system, normally it's going to stop after a while. But, um, for open systems, it's uh, more problematic, of course, but we still have some um, kind of laws like uh, the entropy growth. The typical example being like. If we start with the system with a lot of particles being in this corner of the room, then if we're going to look at some later time, we know that they're going to be more spread around the room rather than, you know, being a different corner of the room. So, um, what quantum thermodynamics is doing, of course, this is thermodynamics studied from the quantum perspective, it's a long history, but the recent approaches from the quantum information perspective is let's try to use minimal assumptions of the quantum theory. To find the constraints on the evolution of quantum systems interacting with some thermal lab. So, we do not aim at solving a particular equation of motion, for example, of a spin coupled to uh, the nuclear spin bus, like an electron spin <laughs> with uh, nuclear spins. No. What you're trying to do is let's say that you have a system, you describe it somehow, it has its Hilbert space in Hamiltonian, and you know this, it's going to interact with some environment, not even assume how this environment looks like. 
you just know that it's going to be a thermal state. And then the question is, what can happen? So maybe this is going to be an illustration of typical open quantum dynamics approach. Is, okay, so this is a block sphere, spin up, spin down state, all the other superpositions of this, you can think, okay, this is a cross section, but you can think that this is a sphere. And uh, the typical approach is, well, let's solve the equations of motion. So let's say that our state starts in row zero, and let's look well, how it looks like when it evolves in time. I think if I remember correctly, this is a path when you solve the James Hamming's model. So when you're when when you have a qubit system that is coupled to a harmonic oscillator, and this harmonic oscillator is initially prepared in a thermal state. So you, so then this is like what people studied before. This is a standard approach. This research theoretic approach says the different. It says Let's assume our state starts here, and let's assume that it's going to couple to some term of that. And but we don't know which it doesn't have to be a harmonic oscillator. It can be many qubits, it can be many harmonic oscillators, it can be some continuous that doesn't matter. And, and the only thing that matters is that the, the path is referred to a term of which state at the beginning. And we ask what can happen after some time t. And you can solve it actually and find that it, it is going to be constrained to this. This set. You don't know which one, but you definitely know it's not going to be here or here. So, of course, you can overlap those guys and you see that actually this particular dynamics, of course, fits in, inside this uh, blue region. Otherwise, we test these things. All right. So, what is How the, do you know yes. that they are allowed states which are in agreement with the laws of thermodynamics without the solving? <coughs> without, asserted, without solving. No, no, not we all. I understand yes. that we are still. No, no, of course, no, it's not about thinking about the it's not about, it's not about solving. It's not about the, it, it, it's not that we do not solve anything. It's a, a little bit like here. Of course, you have to solve. Like if you know that the energy is constrained, you still have to solve and you're going to get the ellipses. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. right. So we still solve something, just do not assume yeah. a particular interaction. Then okay. what, what's the meaning of the word solving in this? Well, if you listen for the next. 15 to 20 minutes, maybe you're gonna learn. This is the aim of the stuff. But anyway, the question remains valid. What is meant to know something about the final state with compatible with the laws of thermodynamics? What is meant by a state being compatible with the laws of thermodynamics? Mm -hmm. Laws of thermodynamics are this. Well, the uh, classical mm -hmm. understanding of the word of the dynamics mm -hmm. applied to the many. So it's applied to the many space. Yes, of course. And here it's going to be like, I can tell you, the final it's going to be a just the ones. No, no, it's, it's the statistical approach. If you prepare the system in a row zero, you make an experiment in which it's going to interact with the bar, you repeat it up 10,000 times. After the after each time you do the you try to do the, the state tomography, so you recover the final state and it's gonna be somewhere here. That's just it. Very simple. Uh, you let me, I think it's important to understand it correctly because mm -hmm. I don't know what these resources. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. So let me just say, see maybe let me just explain how what are these simplest assumptions that we use, okay? So the simplest assumptions that like the conservation of energy that was there on for closed systems is like, like this. You have your system, how it's going to evolve. We know that the most general evolution of a, of a, of a quantum system is described by quantum channel. So we can, there's a, a subset of those introduced in this work by Kordetsky and Nottenheim when they try to model how the interaction with the bar would affect the system. So look, this is. This is the, the evolution of the system acting on this dot. Here, this is the system. What we can do, we can bring a thermal bar. What this is, is any described by any Hamiltonian. This can be a harmonic oscillator, or those many qubits, whatever you want. And you couple them by an entire interaction. So, uh, because after all, every open dynamics is a closed dynamics of, of a bigger system. Right? So, the only thing that is assumed here is first of all, this bigger system that we bring is in thermal equilibrium already. At some time with respect to some temperature. And the second thing that is that is uh, assumed is that the total energy is conserved. So that this that this unitary can only move energy between the system and the bar, but can just create energy out of now. So you can see, yeah, this is basically the situation. You have the system, you bring a thermal bar, you make the energy conserving interaction, and then you trace away 
in a simple scenario that in the more extended scenario you must have here any. So you, 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 you trace away any subsystem and you can think of this as in the following way. Let's say you have one spin particle and then you have a bar of many spin particles. You can make them interact and then you don't tra tra trace away all the, the spins of the bar, but let's say you, you keep three of them. So this way you map from one spin to three spins. Okay, I'm going to go to this right later when we get there. Okay, of course, um, the give state of the system is, is given by a standard formula, e to minus h. Mm, normalized kb is everywhere set to one, so we don't have to worry about this. And now in this setting, the, 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 the important problem that people study is the state interconversion. So basically, this thing that I tried to show on the previous slides <laughs> is the yeah, this is what define the temperature. Well, well if, if, if you have a, a system in Hamiltonian H which couples to the heat path, mm -hmm. it is the heat path which defines the temperature. Yeah. So, so the heat as we the typical meant by the background. Right? As the same as in the standard 19th century thermodynamics, you, you basically know that the, the, the bar that you consider here is bigger than Can I finish the sentence, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, the bar that you are connecting your system with is obviously in contact with even a bigger bar, right? So there is some background temperature heat. So there is a third system in the okay. Yeah, you, you, you can assume that it's so the temperature yeah. is a temperature by something which is larger than the of course temperature. because your system usually yeah. just interacts with a small part, right? You, you have a quantum system that interacts with this nearest interface. And then it, this is, I mean, I'm try, just trying to explain what in the 19th century books tell about what is uh, equilibrium, thermodynamic equilibrium, right? But this third system is not necessary in the usual thermodynamics. What do you mean it's not in the usual thermodynamics? Well, the, the usual thermodynamics is a science which exists oh. almost 200 years. Mm -hmm. That's but, what I meant by the normal thermodynamics. Well, probably not then. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go. Because the temperature mm -hmm. in the thermodynamics is determined by the temperature of the heat bar. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the point is, look, you're going to interact your system with something that already thermalizes with its bigger environment. I mean, I don't see any. I don't know if you want to go into a philosophical discussion here or like it's pretty okay. I can tell you uh, operationally, it's a system that was left for long enough to go into. No, a, I'm asking uh, whether the commutators are mm -hmm. stuffing the, uh, the you had to just a question mm -hmm. that the commutator of a Hamiltonian of the system uh, huh? has mm -hmm. the Hamiltonian oh, that, 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 that the equation, right? Yes. So yes. what is about the commutator of the U with the with this other heat bar, which does not appear in your equation? I mean, how can it even be? Yeah, because I mean, this I, 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 I don't know this U. This, this U, U, this U, U, this U. Have, I mean, the U is some in some action on the what system? On A on your system. <coughs> on the bar. On A and the heat bar, right? Yes. And that, that that it might yes. very well. Also interact with this other reservoir because yes. I don't know what what happens but, with this. But you other see, the point, the point is that is the this other reservoir is not the, 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 the point is that we, you do not fix the size of this bar. You can bring anything, right? You can bring bigger and bigger bars, and it's still going to be a thermal operation. This thing is a, can be unbounded. You can be one qubit, you can be in a billion qubits, you can be in the whole universe there, and it's still going to be a thermal operation. So. If you if you want to have an um, interaction with a small subsystem or a bigger or bigger, understand what, why do you need to use the word cube? I mean, this can apply to anything. Yes, thermodynamic applies yes. to the steam yes. engine. Yes, it can be also and if you want if you want a piece of steam engine. Clearly, in order to understand the property of a steam engine, I don't need to know what is it true. But you know what, I, I think there's 20 something more people here that would like to actually hear about some results later. So we can discuss afterwards. Let's go for lunch and we can discuss about these things for, uh, because I mean, I don't want to be rude here, but I think that others would just waste their time otherwise. So, um, because the question is, no, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to be rude. I would like also to be rude, right? Because I think we agree that we can discuss this afterwards. Thank you. So um, it's really weird. I'm here. I was here four years ago, and you were behaving exactly the same way. Nothing has changed. Um, all right. So let's see. 
we want to answer that. So the state integer conversion problem is the following problem. You start with the initial state problem. You have some target state sigma and you ask, can I get there by interacting with some heat bubble at temperature T? So single shot integer conversion then, I'm just introducing the, let's say the definition. Single shot integer conversion is, does there exist a thermal map that maps through sigma? Many copies of that we're going to deal with here because it's going to be this finite size in the title. Is let's say you don't have a single particle and you want to go to a single particle. You start with n copies of a particle. So let's say, and let's say you have n spin systems, spin half systems, and you are asking whether you can go to some number of uh, different systems. So this is exactly where it comes when you can change the number of systems. So for example, you can you can think of this. Let me give an example. Uh, let's say you have a hundred, and this hundred, you have a hundred spin systems at temperature two hundred Kelvin, and you and you have access to a bar at a hundred Kelvin. So you see, you have a out of equilibrium uh, initial state. And the question is like, can I now make these things interact with each other so that at the end I'm going to have a hundred and fifty spin uh, systems at temperature I don't know two hundred twenty or two hundred ten, right? So you can change the number of the systems because you can get them from the heat bar. And the question then is going to be about the optimal rate. How, you know, for one out of equilibrium system at temperature 200 Kelvin, how many you can get at temperature 201, let's say. Um, all right. And half of the presentation is about incoherent in the conversion, which basically is where your initial states and final states that you want to get to are um, all diagonal in the energy base. So they are just mixtures of energy eigenstates. There's no superposition. There's no Kind of quantum superposition involved there. And this state uh, can be represented by the eigenvalues, basically. So in instead of having a whole density matrix, you can just give a probability distribution saying with probability P1 it is in the ground state, P2 in the first excited state, P3 in the third excited state, and so on. So yeah, P for initial, Q for final, or, or rather uh, more generally, rho for initial and sigma for final in this presentation. <coughs> and the keep state all the time, the thermal state is represented by gamma. Right. So why? Okay. So quite interestingly, like ten years ago, uh, Michal Oleksii Oppenheim solved actually showed that this incoherent conversion for a single shot is completely described by something called thermomodulization. And given the um, given the generality, it's quite generality of the framework that you can bring any thermal graph and make it interact and so on and so forth. It's quite striking that the result is very simple. And the result looks like this. I'm going to show this in one slide of thermomodulization means. So basically, let's say you have a three level system in one particle. And it's going to be in, a, in, a, in the um, um, its occupations of the over its energy eigenstates. It's going to be P1, P2, and P3. And you construct this segment. This is geometric. This is a geometric um, uh, characterization of thermomodulization. So you construct this segment uh, that have the vertical value of the occupation and the, the horizontal value the, uh, the the corresponding occupation of the thermal state so what would be the occupation of this the, this energy level if this system thermalized to thermal equilibrium with this with respect to this temperature the background temperature and you do exactly the same you construct those kind of segments for your final state you have those segments, and now well, the only thing that you need to do is you need to form lower scales out of them, which is basically you take them and you need to con construct convex scales. So the, con the convexity requirement will tell you which what is the order of those, right? The, the steepest one will go first, then the second steepest, then the first steepest. And you do exactly the same for the Q1. And now the result is that if the initial curve, the blue one, lies above the final one, the green one here, then there exists a transformation. So in other words, Let's let's look at this operation now. You have a spin one system and it's in out of equilibrium state described by P1, P2, P3. You and you have the access to thermal heat bump and you can make it interact. And you have no restrictions on those interaction terms, apart from the fact that the energy cannot come from nowhere. It has to come, from, well, it has to be the energy has to be conserved. <coughs> then, and in the laboratory, you want to prepare the other, uh, you want to change the distribution over the energy eigenstates so that it is skewed. The question is, can you do it? Well, if this curve lies above the other, then you can do it. Just quite um, slightly how simple that is. All right, so why do we care about those interconversion problems? And uh, the reason is that a lot of 
questions that people started in thermodynamics or rather in the intersection between thermodynamics and information theory is can be answered in this can be framed in this language very uh, in a very simple way so for example there's this concept of work extraction right so you have uh, an out of the equilibrium system and you and and you would like to perform work using it right you know that you can let's say connect an out of equilibrium system like the simplest thing you can think of is you have access to a heat valve at some temperature and you have an ice cube of course you can connect it and while while the ice cube melts uh, you can extract, you can convert some heat into work, so you can perform some mechanical work. The nice thing is here that you also can frame, you can also frame questions like the zero tangent. So, oh, I have a, I have a particle, I have one bit of information. How much can I use this one bit of one bit of information? Meaning that I have a two-level system and I know that it's exactly in the ground state or in the excited state. And now the question is, how much work I can. You know how much work I can perform using this information. This framework is very simple. I mean, you you simply take the system to be in the in the ground state. Let's say you bring the battery system and you ask, does there exist a thermal operation that transforms this system so that you can it thermalizes and at the same time the battery system is excited from zero to one, where the energy value is W, which is the work performed. And you can recover all those kind of results like zero engine that one bit of information is for k k below two. Of, of work. You can also do the lambda where we the schemes. So this is like the other way around. You start with some with some information register that you would like to reset to a zero value and, and then you're gonna use some battery system in the excited state and you want to basically erase the memory and you want to reset it to a well-known state. The question is how much work you need to to uh, invest there. So you can again ask we can again frame this as an interconversion problem where we start with your memory register, we start with your battery system inside cycle state, and you ask, does there exist a thermal operation that maps it to some fixed state? And uh, at the same time that the battery gets um, de excited. And the question is when you can do it, for what W you can do it. And again, you're going to find out the Landauer's result from the 60s that it's going to be KT log 2 for every, uh, for every bit, or if they, they are not degenerate. In, even more um, complicated results. So, okay, I'm not gonna just waste some time. Like, there's also some interesting connection with like, is there a thermodynamic uh, cost for communication? So you can start with some system and you can ask how many messages I can encode without investing any work just by the fact that it's an out of equilibrium system. But okay, let's just skip this. Um, all right, so let's go to results and here and think very much. So, this is still an old paper, not my paper, that studied the so called asymptotic rate. So, it's not that you start with five particles and you want to get to some other five particles, but you start with n when n is large. Large, meaning whatever you like, 10,000. It's going to be asymptotic approximation. It's going to be correct when the n goes to infinity. And they realize that when you start, with a um, state described by P and you want to go to Q, the rate at which you can do it is exactly given by this ratio of relative end of I'm going to show the equation as I like what this is. But again, what you have to think about this is again like the spin system. So you have, let's say, N spin systems in one state and you want to get to Rn spins in the other state by just interacting with the heat bus and getting the additional systems from the heat bus. So what is interesting is that those relative entropies, so those are, yes? Okay, no question. Um, so those relative entropies are information measures, um, but you can actually physically interpret them because we know that this gamma i is actually e to minus beta e i divided by, by z. So when you just plug it in, you're going to find out that this physical interpretation of this relative entropy is really the average energy of your state minus its and Shannon entropy times temperature. This really, really, really resembles the expression for free energy to the average energy minus u minus t f minus, and this is the free energy of the um, of the thermal state. So this is basically uh, the amount of free energy over the lowest point, which is the lowest point is just the free energy of the geek state. And what does it mean? What, what can we get when we have this kind of transformation rates? Well, what does it result in? If you start with n copies of rho and you want to go to r n copies of sigma with this r. Then you can start with this Rn copies of sigma and go back to 
R prime Rn copies of, of rho, where now the initial and final state change roles. But the important thing is that now when you multiply R and R prime, because they were just a simple ratios, they just give one. So what you see is that in this asymptotic limit, when you when you start when you process infinitely many copies of the system, you can actually have you actually get reversible the conversion. So you can go from any state to any state and back, and you don't lose any. But this is of course only in this in this um, idealized scenario when the number of particles you process is, is infinite. So now the equation of free energy in this table, then let's call it thermodynamic energy when you have infinitely many copies of the system, like a large number. Now let's go to our finite size effects from the title. So finite size irreversibly. So of course, the same way as you can tailor expand some function around zero to just look how it looks like close to zero, not exactly at zero. You can do the so-called asymptotic expansions around infinity. So you don't say what is going to be the result at infinity, but rather you're going to say, okay, it's going to be something plus some correction terms. Okay, so it's going to be this. Previous result, the infinity dot plus some plus minus some correction terms that can, in principle, depend on the initial final state, final state, the number of copies you have, and the error of transformation. I didn't mention this yet, but of course, you can always say, I don't want to go exactly to the state. I can get epsilon away from it in whatever measure you like. Let's say integrity here, I guess. So this is this is the question: what kind of corrections there is going to be in? What one finds out is that the relevant um, quantities to de de describe this irreversibility are given by, as we had before, relative entropy. Now we have the, the, the notion of relative entropy variance. Um, and its physical interpretation is a little bit uh, harder, let's say, but you can think of this intuitively as the. As is, if, is your system finite N or? This assumption uh, applies also to this other two system. No, no, your system, your system, 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 no, no, your system, system. Your bar can be, as I said, this space forever. The bar can be as big as well as, as you want. Just your system that you process is small. Um, so you can think of this relative entropy bias, you can think of this as follows, as follows. If you consider that the, the free energy is, is an average of some random variable, then the relative entropy variance is the variance of this of this random uh, variable. And you can also see, let's say, if you do look at this relative entropy variance for between a deep state at a different temperature and a deep state at the background temperature, it's going to be proportional, it's going to be given by the proportion of a specific heat, heat capacity with some kind of factor there. The important thing is going to be basically that if you go from, if this rate is going to be smaller than the asymptotic rate, and the other one also going to be smaller than the asymptotic rate. Well, we expect this, and I'm going to show you the next slide that's going to happen. So you, you will not be able to close the cycle, right? You're going to have instead of rate one, you're going to have I don't know 0.99 here, for example. So you basically start getting irreversibly and irreversible. Process. So this is what I meant by saying finite size effects. Basically, you can't make any more those perfect um, thermodynamic cycles. And okay, so some results first. So what we find out is that the um, if you try to get start from P and go to Q and you want to find the, the optimal rate and you don't go exactly to, to R and copies of Q, but rather you get epsilon away from them and you can control the time for a constant, you can choose whatever constant the time you want, you're gonna get such an expression. So you, you get the old result, then you get some terms that scale, uh, they, they die out faster than one over square root of n, and then you get this correction term. Which is basically having some free energy fluctuations. It has one over the square root of n dependence, so it, it decays like one over the square root of n. And then there is this uh, function of error uh, that this is going to be reversibility parameter uh, here. Uh, that's going to be important later. Let's not focus too much on it. You can just look at it that, that it's actually it's the ratio of the relative free energy fluctuations. So this is. Free energy content, this is fluctuations, this is relative free energy fluctuations of the final state, and this is the relative free, uh, free energy fluctuations of the initial state. Uh, I don't want to go, this is basically a rate normal distribution, so handy of the distributions introduced by uh, Kumagai and Hayashi in this 2017 paper. It, we don't really care. This basically describes, well, this is very interesting, but uh, for us now, it just describes the indicator of the error uh, distance. So, uh, a stupid question. So, it looks like the second term is positive, no? So, 
I mean, this would make this, very... this thing. Yes, so it, 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 there is a plus here. Yeah, that's, that's exactly why this graph is here. The graph is here uh, to show that if you go to small errors, you can, so you can get bigger rate. If, let's say if you allow the error to be one half, so 50%, I mean, then you can oh, okay. even get up a bigger conversion rate. But as you go to small errors, this is the error name, you're always going to find out that it's going to be negative, right? It's going to be negative also. The only exception is you can see this newly called one here. So this is called really normal distribution because when mu is equal to infinity or zero, it becomes like a normal distribution. And when it's one, it becomes like radial distribution. Everybody knows what a normal distribution is. I guess I didn't know what radial is. I should have come when I was doing this. But what is important for radial distribution is that it doesn't have any, it doesn't have any um, uh, support on the negative side. So basically, then you see that this is the only one that you actually can have zero error, and this error vanishes. I'm going to discuss this in the next slide. Um, so, so, if I'm, uh, so you measure the, this error in the uh, distance? So here, so here it's in PDA. Uh On the slide, maybe 20, it's gonna, we change the gears and we go to TPD. But this is in PDA. Yeah. Sure. And like, uh, can you give some hair of expansion process? Like, the, I, I expect there will be some uh, interplay between dimension of your system and the number and the n, uh, right? So, what's that, what's that, what's that, yeah. I mean, like, if uh, for fixed dimension of your principal system, yes. there will be some typical n where those finite size and until which those finite no, size I mean, effect what, kick in. Mm -hmm. no, it's not really so. So the finite size effects are always just established by n. There's no yeah. there's no dimensionality of the system. The dimensionality of the system is somehow hidden in this mm -hmm. factor mm -hmm. here, which is relative entropy variance divided by relative entropy. So okay, so um, right. yeah, um, and then and then. Sure, it yeah. depends on specific right. sure. All right. Uh, let's see. So, so this is just uh, this is just the formula that is derived, and mm -hmm. and then we can do some numerical simulations and try to find out. Well, I, we want to optimize this kind of interactions with the bath and so on, and we try to find the best um, rate that you can get numerically, and you can plot so the 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 the, dot, the, the lines, the, sorry, the dots here. Are exactly this numerical optimization of the rate for different uh, number of, I think, this is two level systems. And those are our asymptotic approximation. So you see, it is, it only works when, it should only work when n is really, really large, but already at, uh, at n equal 20, we start from 20 here, you see that it actually looks pretty good. I mean, of course, we could maybe find examples when you need bigger one of some of those lines. So this is just uh, to show that those um, formulas actually are. Correspond to reality and they're applicable. Let's see. Uh, one can also look at okay, so some more finite size effects very quickly. Of course, you can you can convert uh, non equilibrium resource data, state that's out of equilibrium, uh, into work. You can perform, you can extract work from it. I mean, you can use it while in terms like, like in this example with the ice cube that melts, and while it melts, you, the heat flow can be used to, to perform work. So you can also find in this uh, in this kind of a language when you start with the wrong bar, you bring some system and you, you you want to charge some battery, and this is called distillable work. So how much you can charge the battery given like the system given a like given a system at wrong. And the other question is work dilution, which is you start you, you have only thermal states and you invest work, you perform work on them to bring them out of equilibrium, and this is called work of formation. So there's this distillable work, how much you can get from something, and the work of formation, how much you need to invest to get this thing. And then if you use these results, uh, you're going to find out that in this large N regime, you're going to have this uh, kind of um, symmetric uh, splitting between what you can. So this is what you need to invest, and this is what you need to get. You're always going to lose, right? I mean, against the law, second law of thermodynamics, you can never win. Like in the infinite limit, those two things get to, to each other. In the single shot regime, they were also started. Those are those uh, mean and max uh, relative entropies. And in this regime, intermediate regime of large number of copies, you see that uh, you're going to get this delta W, which basically, and you see that it actually is really the free energy fluctuations and then some factor in the error. All right, so dissipation of free energy. Okay, we've said this. Um, okay, so this is what I'm going for, the Remick was asking a second ago. So we can also do this kind of derivations in, in the, uh, so. Technically speaking, what I was presenting before is a sort of small deviation regime where 
you try to do this asymptotic expansion, assuming that the error, that your transformation error is fixed, 0 0.1 or 0 0.001. But you can also do this, this moderate regime where you say, no, I want my error actually to decrease as n increases. So you can you can have your error being a function of n and for some whatever alpha you want between 0 and 1. And then you're also going to be able to uh, derive optimal rates and it's going to be a little bit different than the factors. But what I, what, why I did show it like that here is because of this here. Before it was this really normal distribution, it was not that easily visible. But here you clearly see that if mu is equal to 1, then this whole term disappears. Right? So you only get the asymptotic rate, this reversible rate, and maybe some higher order corrections that you don't use. <laughs> So, yeah, so basically, then we have no free energy dissipation up to at least second order. And just let's us remind that this new equal one, this was like V divided by V for one state, divided by V divided by V by the other state. So, basically, where your initial and final states are somehow tuned, and when I say tuned, I mean that the measure of the relative free energy fluctuations are the same, then uh, you can do transformations without free energy dissipation. So, you straight away see that there is some connection between. Dissipation and fluctuation. Basically, if those fluctuations are exactly the same, then you don't need to dissipate anything up to second order. And this is what we call. Yes, please. Uh, yes, maybe I misunderstood something, but uh, what's kind of the intuition behind like considering even punishing errors? Because I. Uh, like, yeah, so. Is it like more physical or. Like, well, okay, so, so that basically this comes from. From my coding theory, when you try to have this small, moderate, and large deviation regime. So, so in the small deviation, the small deviation regime that I was discussing at the beginning, you you want to you want to do the transformation at the asymptotic rate plus minus some small terms, and this way you're gonna get a constant error. In the large deviation regime, which is on the other side, you say, well, I'm gonna go at constant value below the optimal error. So I'm not gonna get like a one over square root of n connect correction, but I'm gonna just subtract 0.1. This way, the, the error, if you do this, then the error will die out asymptotically. Oh, Sorry, yes, yeah, uh, exponentially. So basically, for the price of decreasing, and this is actually what is being used, for example, for, uh, well, for coding and telegraphs and stuff was, I don't know how internet how it is, but you always go below the capacity because then with the bigger, mm, bigger size of the system or the message you want to send, your error is going to rate, is going to go down. And then in, the, in between, there is this quite technical, let's say, moderate uh, regime where you where you want um, where you go away from your asymptotic rate, not constant amount, but more than one over square root of n. So somewhere in, exactly in between. And this way, your your uh, error is not going to be constant; it's going to decay, but sub exponentially. And the sub exponential is because this n is power alpha, and alpha is smaller than one. Okay. Uh, the, or, or we can also, sorry, one, one last thing, you can also think that this, if the zero is the small deviation because it's going to be to minus zero, it's not going to decay, it's going to be um, constant, and one would be the, the large deviation okay. Right, so we call this thing um, uh, resource resonance. You know, well, resource because it actually appears also in the theory of environment, for example, in coherence, but here for table dynamics, you can just think of, of this. Um, um, Free energy fluctuations being being uh, tuned to each other or in resonance, and there is a okay, it's nice uh, there is this uh, example. Let's say that you have a hot bath, you have a cold bath, and you have a working body, working body consisting of some number n of particles, and then you have a battery system. And what you want to do is, well, your working body starts connected to the cold bath, then you connect it to the hot bath. Uh, you make the, some heat flow from the from the hot bath to the cold bath, so, the, so sorry to the working body, so it heats up. By why it's heating up, it charges the battery, it performs some work on the battery system, and you stop the process not at the level when you thermalize it completely. The typical thing would be you thermalize it all the way to to T uh, TH, but no, you stop you stop at some intermediate time and and see how much work you can work you can get. Uh, all right, and what do you do? Okay, so let's get an example. So this is the setting now. We, we consider this n being 200, some energy gap. Okay, this. So what we have here is on the one. So we now want to try uh, try to extract the amount of this work. We want to charge the battery as if the perfect kernel engine would charge it 
but 95 percent of it. Okay, so we just can compare it to like the best efficiency that could be possible, but we will decrease it because, of course, we have a finite size and so on. And then we look at what is the error of the transformation. So basically, error of the transformation here is the error in the battery. So with the with the error epsilon, we didn't charge the battery. With one minus epsilon, we did charge it to the to the value that is uh, 95 percent of of the thing. And then we realize that there's a very clear uh, resonant peak here. Okay, this is this is what is uh, numerically obtained, and this um, black and white line is where we predicted. This is logarithmic scale, so this is really pronounced. So you see that when the two states are in resonance, so if you choose this TC prime to be appropriate, so maybe you don't extract all the work, but at least the quality goes a lot because you know your failures go failure level goes from like 10% to 10 to minus 4. Um, so 100 percent. Okay, and you can also do the other way around. You can say, oh, I want to extract, I want the error to be fixed 10 to minus 3. How much work can I get with this uh, amount of error? Again, this is now measured by the fraction of the kind of efficiency that you can get. And you definitely see that if you want to have a 10 to a percent error, then you better tune your, yourself to this uh, resonance line. All right. Okay, so now I have uh, 15 minutes left. I'm going to say some things about Documentable in I think I will skip this nice connection fluctuation dissipation theorem. Sorry for that. Um, and then I'm just going to go to the coherent case. So, so far we were discussing um, that your initial state and your final state that you want to get to are uh, mixtures of energy eigenstates. So, this is really, somebody could say, this is really classical. The only quantum thing about this is the fact that the energy levels are discrete and so on. But apart from that, this was really there was no, no possibility for entanglement, there was no possibility for superpositions and so on. So the problem, of course, was that you know the, the, the machinery, um mathematical machinery is needed and people are trying to work on it, but it's not that simple. So let's uh, see how it would look like. So let's say you start in a, a qubit state. So this is a estimated sort of two level system. Uh, in the basis of the energy eigenstate. So with probability P, you are in the uh, ground state, with one minus P, you are in the excited state, and the C describes the coherence between the, uh, between the two levels. So now when you take many copies of the system and you deface them, you mean, I mean, you do the total energy measurement, you can think of that, you're going to kill those whole diagonal terms here. So what is this? So let's think about it. Three copies, so it's eight by eight. So this is like zero, zero, zero. All states are in zero state. This is one, one, one. All states are in one state. This is this block is spanned by the zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and one, zero, zero. So basically, there's two guys in the ground state and one guy in the excited state, and it's here the other way around. And if you make a, if you take a system like that and you make a total energy measurement, you're gonna kill off those of diagonal terms. Now the point is once if you do it like that, if you kill, if you if you if you like allow for this kind of defacing and you throw away this information, let's say, then each block actually can be diagonalized now using energy presenting unitards. Why? Because in each block you only have uh, states with a fixed energy. Like mm -hmm. you can there is a unitary that, that is energy preserving and maps zero one zero to zero zero one simply because they just you can think of this as the second and third system exchange energy conserving it. So then if you do this, you have a diagonal state, right? And with diagonal states, we know exactly how to deal with because I just said that you know this term of utilization curves and so on. So this seems like okay, but you could say, but you lost something in the face, you throw away some information, so probably this is not optimal. But the crucial observation that I'm definitely not going to go into the details of is that, that when you kill this information as n grows, actually you only kill of the order of log n of free energy. And we are just, uh, and we, what we want to do, do here is the asymptotic expansions of the first order, which is square root of n. Square root of n is much faster than log n, so log n we can throw away. So, in other words, if we are interested at only up to second order, so Corrections up to terms of one over square root of n, and we can really, you can do this thing, and it's not going to be stuff optimal. You can do this thing, meaning you can make the, free, the, the total energy measurement, then you can diagonalize your thing, and then you can use the old tools. I mean, of course, it's going to be harder because now, before those things were IID, so you only had to consider like term visualization of 
ID um, dependent identity distributed uh, random variables. Here it's going to be different because each block is going to have, um, you know, those. This is going to be generally a, a not that simple uh, um, probability distribution. But you can do this, and actually, then this is a preparation that's going to should appear on IP before QIP twenty twenty three this year, so in like two weeks. What you find out now, and now I'm going back to me, how you asked about the uh, infidelity for the measure. Here we use uh, for technical reasons not infidelity but total variation distance. Um, so then you get a really similar expression <laughs> as as we call what was the previous expression. Previously we had those Vs with those were probability vectors. Those are classical probability theory, let's say, or classical information theory um, expressions. And here we just replace them with the with the quantum generalizations when those are relative quantum multiple properties and quantum relative uh, relative field or it's relative variances, relative entropy variances. They think all the, the only difference is also this guy and this guy differs a lot. They differ a little because this was this very really normal distribution. This is called sesky normal distribution that we introduced in this paper. But that's only because we changed from infinity to to total variation. Yeah. Um, so then you are like, that's great. So basically, what what is the take uh, take home message with this coherent result is that if you have enough, if you consider really a large number of systems, so you're just interested in second order asymptotics, then really the coherent thermodynamics behaves the same way as the classical one. You just replace those parts. So one could say nothing, <clears throat> one could say we could expect this. Of course, you could expect this. But in some sense, it is like it's like that if you start considering many systems, like this quantum behavior is not really that important anymore. Okay, and then you basically, of course, can you, yes, please. Well, just a simple question. So how do you recover like the second formula from, from the first one? So if rho is diagonal now? Yes, if rho is diagonal, but then this thing is exactly equal to this thing and this thing is exactly equal to this thing. Yeah, but S will not be Z, no? So you yes, yes, but then, as I said, S will not be equal Z, but um, the, the, what is S and what is Z? This result tells you this is the rate if you want the infidelity error to be epsilon. This is the result that is TBD. So you would have to map the it's not directly map, yeah. But uh, but you could also actually we also re recover the old result with the TBD and you get then get exactly the same. Okay, so so then of course you can do all those kinds of things like how much work you can extract from coherent bits, how much uh, it costs you to erase a bit some number of bits that are in coherent superpositions or entangled or whatever you want now. And then uh, all right, so Maybe the last thing, do I still have time for one slide? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so uh, remember this uh, coherent, sorry, this resonance phenomenon. So now we have, so when you, you could do things without um, uh, free energy dissipation. So now we have a bigger space, state space because we have all the coherent states and all the mixed states, not only the diagonal ones. So let's consider a very simple example. This is a qubit again, a block sphere. What I'm this is this is a thermal state here. This red dot, this blue dot is where we want to get to. This is our final state, and this is a family of initial states along this line. And what is being plotted on this on this graph here is the the value of this this uh, d divided by d, which is this relative entropy. Uh, sorry, this uh, irreversible reverse divided, this relative and the free energy fluctuations. So okay, so this is the target state. This is the family of initial states, and now. We have, we can take a look at, we want to transform from those guys to this guy at the asymptotic rate. So we're gonna, we try to get um, S, we just forget that, you know, this is a finite number. We just say, let's try to do it at this asymptotic rate. We're gonna end up with some error, of course, because it's probably gonna get some error, but the question is what kind of error we're gonna get. And as you go along this line, you realize that for some levels of coherence level, I mean, for some coherence levels, you're going to go all the way up. Well, this is actually going to zero to minus infinity. Well, optimal error goes to, to really to zero, right? I mean, the exponent goes minus infinity. So you, you realize that we didn't explore this yet that precisely, like carefully, but you see that you're going to have some uh, non trivial inter interplay between how much coherence there is, how much, how much uh, energy this is, what the energy of the system is. It's not a simple example like we had before that is just one one resonant uh, peak. Here you can have actually more. Okay, so this is the simplest qubit example. We already see that there, there can be two resonant peaks, mm -hmm. and and then the question is, 
Well, it seems that sometimes it's um, sorry, and, and it's not that simple that oh, the, the most coherent one is the best or the incoherent. It's actually non trivial uh, behavior. So well, there's some uh, place here for some optimizations and analysis. But as I said, this is in preparation. All right, so um, what is the output? Let me just finish with the outlook. So of course you can you can extend this finite size analysis to other resources. I mean, I already mentioned just why we call it resources. On this actually works for bipartite entanglement and for coherence. But <coughs> basically, this kind of asymptotic analysis was for, in all those kind of resource theories when you have some constraint and you cannot perform all quantum operations. People do analyze the asymptotic interconversion rates, but the second order is well not really done for every. Example there, so this may be technical. Um, well, it would be really interesting to try to design some experimental protocols employing this resonance phenomenon. Could we really see that in some when, when your initial final states are in resonance, you really can do it easy, in an easier way experimentally? So you, you get you know be better, better fidelities and so on. Uh, one thing that we didn't cover and our formalities doesn't cover is when your target state is. Uh, superposition of you know, energy eigenstates. So, so we went from incoherent to incoherent. We now extended it to coherent to incoherent, but coherent to coherent is still an open problem. Um, yes, well, this resonance phenomenon is interesting because it really seems to be some kind of a statistical uh, statistical property of systems where you don't look at the up, well at the average let's say resource content or average free energy but you start looking at fluctuations and then you realize that they are the same then you, you get uh, that you can convert them without dissipation that would be interesting to look at uh, this kind of phenomenon like other information processing tasks and maybe um, okay the last one doesn't make sense because I skip the fluctuation dissipation theorem yeah. and those are the uh, those are the papers that this is was based on and thank you very much. Do we have uh, any questions or comments? Can you pardon? Can you just show for a moment the, the thing that should keep the fluctuation <laughs> theory? Just, of course. To, just to have it, just to have it on the uh, on the screen. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I can say a few words about this, but basically the the original. Um, and where is the where is the relation? Do we have some sort yeah, of yeah? Yeah, I'm just trying. Yeah, I'm gonna maybe try to say. So in the original, uh, the science is more of the fluctuation relation. You had the situation where uh, where the the fluctuations of, of the position of a particle, right? So you have your system in thermal equilibrium, and it's gonna fluctuate. Its, it's position is gonna fluctuate, and this is gonna be directly related. To the dissipated friction when you start driving it out of the equilibrium, right? So you and, and the reason we know what the reason is, right? The, the reason is basically because the source is the same. The, the reason why it's fluctuating randomly is because it's being all the time heat by those particles. And when you try to drive it, the friction is also those particles. So you see that um, the fluctuations at the equilibrium are connected to the dissipation dissipated forces when you try to drive it out. And here what we are trying to do is to say. Look, imagine that the connection is like this. Uh, instead of position fluctuations, you have these free energy fluctuations in your initial state, and you want to move it to a different state. So you want to kind of drive it. And the question now is uh, you want to drive it from, but not from equilibrium, but from one out of equilibrium state to the other out of equilibrium state. And the question then is um, how much you're going to, how much free energy you're going to dissipate? So how much. How much your final state's free energy is going to be lower than the initial one? And what you find out is that this is really given by you see that the dissipated free energy is exactly proportional to the initial fluctuations. So the bigger the fluctuations were, the bigger the dissipation is going to be. So this is kind of it's a really different framework, but uh, we, we, we realize that there must be some kind of even deeper connection that we don't understand. That really we see that the, the, there is a linear dependence a connection between. The optimal amount, so there's many different processes you can go from one out of the frequency to the other, but if you look at the optimal one, the one that dissipates the least free energy, this amount of dissipated free energy is going to be exactly proportional to uh, the free energy fluctuations in your system at the beginning. If there were no free energy fluctuations at the beginning, you wouldn't have to dissipate anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So 
Yeah. What is going to be? There was something about continuity on your last slide in this. Uh, so what do you want to have on my last slide? Sorry. Uh, when you were yeah. extend resource you ready to yes yeah, yeah. So, so so yeah so that's basically uh saying that at this level it's very the connection is very weak we just see that it's similar equation but we thought well if our systems that we are looking to table operations were not just qubits or finite dimensional systems but rather it was a continuous variable system mm -hmm. then we could much easier connect to a Brownian particle or quantum Brownian particle and then we could connect maybe and see the connection that okay uh, I think then it was the next one. Uh, so I wanted to ask about this uh, resonance mm -hmm. effect, whether it applies to other <laughs> transformations like velocity. Yes, it applies to velocity. Yes, I mean, I, uh, so here I, yeah, I mean, when I was making this presentation, I thrown away because I was saying it's finite size effect in thermodynamics. So, yes, it, it definitely, if you do LOCC, mm, so local operations plus <laughs> communication between bipart pure bipartite states, simply because. Mm, simply because the transformation rules are described by majorization, and here thermal majorization is a generalization of it, you're also going to see it. And we really, yeah, I can show you like the graphs how, how it looks like. like. It seems like if you want to get a particular final state, it's better to start with particular initial states, even if they have the same, let's say, um, uh, environment entropy. It would seem they have the same environment entropy, so it would seem, ah, asymptotically they are equivalent, the amount of environment. Is, but then you are like, oh no, this one is actually better. And the reason why it's better is because its fluctuations are more tuned to the final one, and you don't have to dissipate that much. More questions? Uh, I have one question. So, uh, in the second part, when you were discussing, uh, let's say, rotations, uh, sort of after the phasing to phase, you were rotating the ah, here. Uh, yes. in those blocks. Yes. So, I was wondering, like, for many copies, do you have control over, say, complexity or how many kind of primitive operations you need to uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you need to implement realize this unitary because for large systems uh, it would be uh, like yes worst case it would be very bad right yeah of course no no this is a very legitimate question here of course um of course we didn't study because simply because uh uh this wasn't our uh, our well our interest but yes definitely as you this is actually okay. One of the questions that we actually had was like, we find this optimal. What is the optimal thing when you start transforming n systems? But then we were like, can we think of some heuristics at least that would approach this optimal rate? Mm -hmm. Where and how do we build it? Because so it's really the, the, the results are not even constructed. Right? Sorry, the results are not constructed. Yeah, yeah, I tell you that this is the optimal error, mm -hmm. but there is. Well, you have to really work hard to get the constructive thing saying, oh, take those two energy levels and couple them to the bounds and make them whatever, uh, chemicalize for 10 seconds. And then let those two energy levels. So, this in principle could be obtained, but that's, yeah, that's harder. Okay. Let's thank Carmen to the last again.